In this episode, we are going to be reviewing the film noir On Dangerous Ground from 1951. This was directed by Nicholas Ray, and it starred Robert Ryan and Ida Lupino. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube podcast where I explore movies from all over the world and talk about how those stories were told on film as well as interview uh, various industry professionals, among others. And I want to welcome back very special guest, Chaney Ryan, who is the son of the star, one of the stars of On Dangerous Ground, Robert Ryan. But he is also a senior research fellow at Oxford University's Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict where he focuses on nonviolence, pacifism, and the critique of just war theory. He's previously taught at the University of Oregon, where he was a professor of philosophy and co-founded the Peace Studies Program and the Master's Program in Conflict Resolution. And he's also taught at Northwestern University, Harvard Law School, and Boston University. He has been named one of the leading scholars in peace and conflict studies by the Washington Post Plus much, much more. Cheney, welcome back. Thanks for doing this again. Great to be back, Robert. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. You know, it's interesting when I when I looked, when I was reading your website, just the, the wealth of um, things you've done as a professor and your political, political activism. But I know that you also worked as a playwright for a while. And I'm curious, because I know your father dabbled in playwriting himself but did you or your brother or your sister did, did anyone have an interest in acting ever or was that not something anyone got interested in my my brother uh, had an interest in acting and it had, has done some acting uh he's his main passion is music so oh uh, that that became the, the focus of his work uh yeah he, he did some acting uh, er, earlier on and um uh, was in some uh, movies that his friends were involved in back in the 70s, I think, mainly. Uh, um, but no, I never had any interest in being an actor. A uh, number of reasons for that. But uh, uh, And I actually never had any interest in being in Hollywood, quite frankly. Uh, you know, you often read about children of Hollywood people and how, well, of course, you know, they wanted to go into Hollywood, but, but for a number of reasons, I never had an interest in, in, pursuing, in pursuing that. So I became a school teacher instead. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think that has to do a lot with the fact that your parents were very much interested in politics? And as you said, you know, movies were not discussed much at home. Do, do, you, think they got, do you think that has a lot to, to do with where your life led you? No, definitely. Um, I think my mother in particular had very uh, ambivalent feelings about about Hollywood, uh, uh, and I, we we moved to New York City uh, in the early 1960s, um, and and I think there were a number of reasons for that. One of them was someone threatened to bomb our house. I may have mentioned that last time around. Oh yes, I that's in that's in the book that you're on your father that we talked about. Right. Yeah, wow. Uh, uh, Anyway, we moved to New York, and I think part of that was um, my mother uh, very ambivalent feelings about the world of Hollywood and and all of that. So acting was always taken very seriously, but my father was very interested in the theater and uh, took very seriously the work he did in the theater. Um, and that was probably, I got interested in playwriting actually when we moved to New York as sort of uh, an interest of mine. But uh, always, I think we were raised with the message that whatever we were doing, it was important to be politically engaged. It was important to be good community citizens. Uh, that was uh, what was really important and most important. So uh, my, my trajectory of interest is, is really no mystery uh, given that, you know. Right, right. What, I'm I'm curious, you know, because I know you have children of your own, grandchildren. Have you ever shown them your your father's films? And if so, what you know, what what do they generally think? I don't think they're very interested in them, quite frankly. No? <laughs> uh, these these <laughs> movies are from a very long time ago. Uh, it, it's it's hard 
for young people to watch older movies uh, because of the pace yeah. is so different. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I'm trying to remember, I mean, um, so we, we've watched some, particularly with my, my son, Jeff, um, but you know, uh, I don't watch my father's movies very often, quite frankly. Uh, uh, there's, I think when Crossfire is on, I'll usually watch that. Uh, and when the setup is on, I'll usually watch that. I think those are my two. And, and Bad Day at Black Rock, I think is an excellent movie. Yeah. But one of the things that we may have mentioned this last time is, you know, when your father's a movie actor and made a hundred movies and TV, it's really not that big a deal for him to be on the TV. Right. So you don't, you don't plan your day around it. Uh, you, you generally watch the movies that um, uh, you have reason to think are good. I, I, I mentioned that because in, in looking up a little bit about this film today, uh, 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 dad had worked, uh, I think Nicholas Ray had directed Born to be Bad, uh, or maybe John Hausman produced it. There was some connection there at RKO. Uh, and I realized I've yes. never seen that. I've never seen that movie, so I can't comment on it. And quite frankly, if it was on TV, I probably wouldn't make a point of watching it because, <laughs> right. because I don't have a, you know, I have a sense of what movies he made were good and what movies he made were paying the bills. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I haven't seen that one either. I know that in in the book that Jim J.R. Jones wrote, he he you know he had he he had felt a lot of them were not were were really just to pay the bills, and then there's the odd you know there's a there, there's some that he considered great, but um it which, which which is which is true of so many actors' careers. I mean, you 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 can't just wait around. I think Paul Newman said if you waited for a good script, you'd work every four years. Right. <laughs> you know. So, but is it you know is it is it odd to 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 see him on the screen when you when you go back to the film? Does it is it sort of? I'm curious because your father's been gone for so long, and to see him, you know, kind of alive in a way on the screen. I mean, what, what is that? What is that like for you? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, when I watched uh, On Dangerous Ground the other day, um, mainly what's interesting is that most of what he does is acting. But every once in a while, he'll react in a way which is the way he really was. And you sort of are struck by that. <laughs> um, the one scene that I thought was uh, very effective in On Dangerous Ground is uh, the, the, the softer scene between him and Ida Lupino. Uh, uh, yes. And I, I noticed it, in fact, my wife was watching it with me and I, I, I commented, I think critically that uh, the scenes between dad and Ida Lupino were all with him looming over her, you know, standing over her. And I, and I said, I, I'm not sure that's really establishing a connection, but then they had them sit down in front of the fire and they were on the same level. Uh, and, and that was a very nice scene. And, and, and Dad's reactions in that scene were much closer to the way he really was. Oh, the, that's the, interesting. The snarling, uh, you know, cop that he played in the first part of the movie. Uh, the other thing would probably be the, I don't, well, I mean, I don't remember. My, I was born when On Dangerous Ground was made, so I don't have right. much memory of my father back then. Uh, it's different watching the last movies, uh, watching Iceman Comet in particular is an experience. Uh, first of all, because I saw a lot of that movie shot. I was there when it was filmed. Right. And, and also, uh, I do remember him very well, the last part of his life. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I still have to see that. I, I've been meaning to, I've heard it's great. So I, I, I'm going to have to catch that sometime, sometime soon. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that he worked with Nick Ray and he worked with him a few times also on King of Kings uh, and same with Lupino. He did another film with her called Beware My Lovely. Do you know much about how he got on with the two of them and, uh, you know, outside of work or was it mainly a working relationship? Well, he, he knew Nick Ray quite well. And uh, I'll tell you some Nick Ray stories because particularly at the end of his life, uh, Nick would materialize at our apartment. Uh, I think when his career was uh, uh, erratic, mm. yes. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about Nick Ray. Uh, Ida Lupino 
Um, I don't think I ever met Ida Lupino, but I was aware that uh, that they were friends, um, and um, uh, she, you know, and it didn't surprise me because Ida Lupino was a very substantial person. Uh, she doesn't seem to, unlike most of my father's close friends in Hollywood, she doesn't seem to have been uh, politically active, but she was a, a, a extraordinarily substantial woman who uh, probably deserves much more attention. Yes, than is my impression that she gets. I agree. Um, yeah, she was a, became an incredible filmmaker as well. Well, she I actually looked her up. The great thing about do, doing this show, Robert, and the last one is it gives me an opportunity to look into some of these <laughs> movies more than right. I normally do. Uh, <laughs> Ida Lupino was from a, um, a theater background. I think her parents were in vaudeville or they were on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who grows up in that world has, I think, a good sense of all the different things that are involved. So you know that when you become an actor, you're going to have directors and whatever. I mean, I think a lot of people, when they go into acting, they don't fully appreciate how kind of uh, collective a, a thing is. And she was always apparently interested in the different aspects of it. Um, and um, so then she uh, had a very interesting career because uh, I don't consider her to be particularly glamorous, but she she had a very good career uh, mm -hmm. playing the sort of, she, she's sultry, I think would be the word for it. Yes, and I assume, I assume she played that kind of role, and then she she went into uh, she had her own production company for a while, and then went into television. Right. And I knew about her friendship with Dad mainly because Dad did a uh, episode of her TV show as oh. a favor, uh, and uh, he, Dad didn't do a lot of television like that, uh, so I remember that. Ida Lupino was doing a show called um, Mr. Adams and Eve, uh, which which ran for a couple of years. It was a good show with her husband, Howard Duff. Uh, and I remember watching the show. It was interesting. The, huh. the premise of the show was great because the, in the show, they were both movie actors. Um, oh. So the premise allowed them to bring in any movie actor who would come on oh. as themselves. Oh, uh, wow. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to look that up. It's it's hard to find because I actually tried to find information. I did get the title of the episode Dad was in, but there's no record of anything about it. I remember it. Um, mainly what I remember was that Ida Lupino and Howard Duff, I think, were camping somewhere. <laughs> Into the campground walks Robert Ryan. Uh, <laughs> I guess just out camping himself, and it was a very strange interaction. And um, they asked how my mother was, uh, though they didn't use her real name for some reason. And then he waved goodbye and walked on. It's almost uh, like a reality TV show in a way, <laughs> right? The blurring, postmodern blurring of uh, yeah. Um, but the upshot of that was that uh, she gave us a color television set. Oh. Uh, and we didn't have a color television set, so arrives in a big box the first time the Ryan family ever had color TV, and we owed it to Ida Lupino. So <laughs> that's a cool little tale. I like. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, but I don't remember any. I don't. They never. They never were over at the house or, okay. or anything like that. I think they were just professional colleagues. <laughs> right, but but Ray, you said Ray, you you knew more. He was. He was over at the house more uh, in the seventies. You had mentioned or earlier. Well, yeah, they were friends, and and uh, I, I mean, I based solely on what I've read about Dad uh, and and Ray. Uh, they seem to have been um, they seem to have been close uh, personally. Uh, you know, Ray had the, a kind of uh, erratic personal life. Uh, that, that didn't really meld with the kind of life my parents had. Uh, though, interestingly, he was married to Gloria Graham, who also worked with dad on Odds Against Tomorrow, right. among others. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, my parents were not into uh, all that 
scandal stuff. And m most of the people that they were friends with were pretty normal people. But Ray was kind of, yeah, I always thought of him, dad's relationship with him is similar to with Peck and Paw. Uh, you know, he was kind of a man's man. You got that impression. And, you know, that was my father's was sort of into that. Uh, they did uh, the movie. I The movie my father talked about more that he did with Nicholas Ray was a movie called Flying Leathernecks. Uh, oh, I don't know that one. Well, it's actually, it's one of these, you know, RKO programmers, as they called them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting movie. It's it's uh, got John Wayne and Robert Ryan are both um, Marine, they're Marine uh, pilots. So the Marine Corps had its own Air Force and a Leatherneck is a Marine pilot. So it was one of these post-war movies. Uh, the, the main story I remember from that, the only story I remember from that actually is that um, dad, dad, dad told me the story once that, that um, my father had been in the Marines in World War II, but uh, John Wayne had been a draft dodger. John Wayne had avoided military service. Uh, and this was something that everyone in Hollywood knew was that John Wayne had put his career uh, over over uh, fighting for his country, as it were. Uh, so this annoyed Nick Ray. Um, and uh, so Nick Ray in Making Flying Leathernecks used to ridicule John Wayne uh, about it. And at one point um, uh, he, he told Wayne that he didn't know how to salute properly. Uh, so he got the cast of Flying Leathernecks, whoever was there that day around, and he said, uh, who, who here fought for their country? Oh, and a no. bunch of people, listen to this, a bunch of people, a bunch of these guys raised their hands. So he found the guy who was like lowest on the totem pole, you know, a guy who just had a walk on, who was like, looked 12 years old and whatever. And he said, well, you're going to teach John Wayne how to salute. So why don't you go off in the corner and teach him how to salute properly? Because Wayne was not in the military and you were. I mean, my father took great delight in this story. Okay. <laughs> uh, because part of the problem being, of course, that Wayne played an officer, so didn't have much occasion to salute in the movie. So this was just to, to ridicule him. Oh, God. I haven't yeah. seen that one. I know that they, um, there's a story that Jim told in the book where your, your father challenged him to a fight at a certain point because uh, I think he was. Uh, Wayne was uh, picking on his politics or something along those lines. But is it, is it true that he was, there's a story where he was, uh, you mentioned that the bomb threat and he was like in front of the house once and he was waiting to make, he was kind of, <laughs> he was working almost the security to make sure nothing happened. I don't know, is that a true story? The, the story is that he wanted to do it. Um, and I think in some tellings of it, particularly late at night, that morphed into he actually did it. <laughs> but uh, they were, uh, when our house was threatened, um, and I think, by the way, Jim and his book about dad, which again, I would I'd recommend, he has yes, a wonderful way of, of putting it about how it was elaborated. I think his phrase is elaborated into an Irish tale, which I take to mean <laughs> Blarney. Um, no, R Wayne and, and dad were shooting the longest day at the time and their sequence in that movie, they, they were both you know in the same scenes in the movie uh and so the and they were in london the film was shot in london so um uh when the bomb threat came in my father was in london he was out of town so the, the issue immediately became you know what was going what, what were we going to do about this bomb threat and apparently you know wayne went off the handle about you know he was going to come back and def defend innocent women and children and stuff but uh, my father discouraged discouraged that, and uh, but it, it makes a good story. <laughs> no, it definitely, it he could, definitely he does. Could, he could have he could have uh, staked out our house along with uh, you know all the other John Ford regulars, you know Lee Marvin and people like yeah. that. Yeah, you know? that would have been quite a photo to get. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And did you have any personal? Um, encounters with Ray over the years or was it mainly just you know stories you heard well he showed up at our part my main dealings with him was actually very late in my father's life uh he um 
uh, could not get a movie job. Uh, I, I don't think he did really any directing the last part of his career. Uh, and so he was trying to get a job uh, at a film school. Uh, right. And I know my father was instrumental in getting him interviews, but he managed to blow the interviews both times. One of them was at Brandeis, where my father was friends with the head of the film program there. The other was at NYU, which is, of course, the top film school now. And I don't know how long it had been around then or if they really had a film school or just a program. Uh, but what happened was that, that Ray showed up at our apartment uh, when he was doing the, the NYU interview and he actually stayed around. Uh, and it was after my mother died. So, uh, so my, and there was a period of it, my father was not even there. So it was just me and me and Nicholas Ray. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't really, I mean, I knew him, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how highly regarded he was then. <laughs> and if he was highly regarded, I didn't know it. Right. Uh, uh, I mainly knew him as the director of a movie called King of Kings, uh, yes. which I had seen part of that film. And that was one of the more uh, bizarre experiences, quite frankly, of my youth, because uh, King of Kings is a biblical epic uh, about the life of Jesus, uh, very reverent, uh, with music by Nicholas Rosa and all very, very uh, and, and it was, for some reason, they chose Nicholas Ray to direct it. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure, I think there's a backstory there about how the movie was financed, quite frankly, that he ended up there. But it was bizarre because uh, I was at the set and Nicholas Ray, you know, dressed like, like a loan shark. I mean, he looked like <laughs> someone out of his film noir movies with, with the eye patch. Yeah. And... Um, he uh, is wandering around this uh, people in togas, you know, supposed to be biblical times. Uh, and he had a very difficult time getting along with Jeffrey Hunter, who was playing Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, the scene I saw um, was where Christ was supposed to be delivering the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and Jeffrey Hunter couldn't remember the words, apparently. Uh, and so it consisted mainly of Nicholas Ray screaming at Jesus, uh, remember the goddamn words, while oh, God. all these Italian extras are sitting around wanting to, to do lunch break. Uh, so that was my memory of, of Nicholas Ray was this kind of odd guy. Uh, and so I didn't really... I, the only other thing I knew about him was that he had discovered James Dean or he'd, you know, done the early, he'd done Rebel yeah. Without a Cause. Rebel, yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I do remember the one thing I could ask him about was that and he told me that uh, his life was really um, destroyed when James Dean died. Um, in fact, he said he wished James Dean had played Jesus in the movie instead of Jeffrey Hunter. That would have been a good film. Mm. Uh, so that that was very poignant, you know, his relationship with James Dean. But yeah, so he would he would he was around for a few days, and he would come back and drink all the beer in the icebox, uh, and uh, rant about producers and Hollywood and whatever. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you have to remember again, Robert. I mentioned this last time. You know, you, when you're that age, that you don't know these people are Nicholas Ray. You know, right. You don't of course. I'm talking to Nicholas Ray, and and so uh, now you know, you kind of think, gee, I'd be interested in knowing this about him or that about him or whatever. But I right. was what, what I was uh, 21 years old when this was happening. You know? Right. I still I've actually yet to see King of Kings, but your he's John the Baptist in that your dad, I believe. Uh, I, I believe that's who he plays. You, you can skip through it up to the John the Baptist scene. <laughs> uh, the um, it's it's not a I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's a very good movie. Um, yeah, I've heard mixed things about it. I, 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 I yeah, I don't I'm not sure how, you know. It depends on what, what, how people take to it. But I, I just in the book, I didn't even know your dad was in it until I read uh, J.R. Jones's book. 
and he was John the Baptist. So I could see that actually. <laughs> I could no, see him in that a, part. He's got a nice scene. And the, the best thing about that movie when I was a kid was that uh, John the Baptist, of course, uh, has his head cut off by Salome. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a scene where in the movie, I mean, John the Baptist is, I think, in three or four scenes. Uh, and then the, the penultimate appearance is with his head cut off uh, after Salome ices him. And um, so um, we got the head they used. Uh, they did this uh, rubber head of dad to look like dad with his head cut off. So we actually <laughs> got that and we had it around the house for a while. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I always... We, we just would look at it, but I always thought we should have brought it out for dinner one night on a plate. Um, <laughs> Where did that wound? Did you still have it or is it gone? No, I think, it, I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. It might have been lost actually. In, oh, it's too bad. In the move. Yeah, in the move. Yeah, from, you can uh, auction that off now. <laughs> that's right. I could put it on eBay and be rich. <laughs> Sell it to TCM or. <laughs> oh, those are some great stories. Um, what. So uh, what, what, do you remember the first time you saw On Dangerous Ground? I don't. I saw it on television. Uh, uh, I got interested in film noir generally some years ago. Uh, I don't think it was actually because of dad's, uh, I mean, dad's involvement with the genre probably had something to do with it, but it was as much that some of the other classics were movies that I liked a lot. And I think I'm, so that was probably about 15 years ago. So I didn't, certainly didn't see it when it came out. Okay. Uh, and as I, I think I mentioned last time, um, you know, for much of my life, it was very difficult to see these movies. Right. Because they didn't, they didn't have streaming. Uh, so the only way you could see them is they popped up late at night on million dollar movie or something like that. Uh, but when I got, I think I actually got a, a, a DVD of On Dangerous Ground, and that was the first time I, I, I looked at it. Um, and <clears throat> so that was the first time I became aware. I mean, I might have seen parts of it on TV off and on. But... So, so you only saw it about 15 years ago for the first time. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I would have thought, uh, I don't know why I just thought maybe this is something you had seen in the 60s or something. But yeah, you're right. As you said, unless it was on TV. Um, there, there was, there was no way of, of seeing it. So what was your, uh, what was your impression this time around uh, of the film? Well, I think it's a strange movie. I mean, um, it is. Uh, yeah. It's a very strange movie. Um, and, um, it, it, it's, as people say about it, it's kind of two movies. Yes. Uh, you can kind of see there's a logic to the two parts of it. Um, and uh, uh, so it makes sense. The movie makes sense. But I, I think the you know, enduring question about On Dangerous Ground is how much the two pieces fit together. Mm. Uh, I think when I first saw it, I was just struck by it visually because uh, the first half of the movie is typical noir you know yes. dark uh crowded bars you know crowded restaurants the uh claustrophobia the you know the, the dominant mood of noir is kind of claustrophobia but very very dark and then suddenly they're in snow <laughs> yes and, and not just snow but landscapes of snow mm -hmm. um and it's only when they get back into Ida Lupino's house and then the last part of the movie that it, it sort of comes back to something more intimate and whatever. Uh, and, and I, to this day, I, I think the visual dimension of it is, is the most striking part of it. Uh, you know, again, whether or not it, it works, uh, I, I'm just not sure. I mean, it's a very interesting movie, but whether or not it works. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I, I, I'm not a scholar of these things, so I don't know what the commentary is like about it. Um, I can see why people would find it a very interesting movie. Yeah. Uh, and then apparently uh, the ending was a matter of great controversy. Uh, I did read about that 
looking into the movie a little bit. Um, what was it? Because uh, I, I must have missed that. What, what was the controversy over uh, ha- having it end on that happy note? I, I imagine was that not what they what Ray wanted. Well, I know that they didn't know how to end it. I mean, they, I know that there was disagreement about it. And I would imagine that if, if Ray, my understanding of it was that there was a, once they had kind of put together a full edit of it, there was just a lot of disagreement about how to end it. Um, and I think the original ending had been dad going back to um, whatever city that is and uh, returning to a life as a cynical cop. Uh, well, that was, I think, the original ending. And, uh, but I think the feeling was it didn't work. But in particular, my understanding is that Dad and Ida Lupino didn't think it worked. So I, my understanding is that they were the ones who said, well, let's add on the scene of, uh, of them reconciling at the end and apparently that was the scene that Ida Lupino herself directed uh right so, or at least she blocked it out yes um, because he he had he had become sick Ray for so she had taken over for a number of days uh I read yeah yeah that's it I I I, I wasn't sure which part she may have directed but I think that's yeah <laughs> I could see the softer side of that scene that perhaps uh, likely it was her. I, 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 f- I felt that him coming back, I, you know, I just didn't quite buy the fact that they, it would have been so uh, romantic, particularly because her brother just was literally was just died. And after all that, I thought perhaps um, if he had just come back and, and she let him in, they may, maybe that would have been more believable because ultimately they're both these lonely characters. So some kind of, connection at that point I think some kind of optimism would have been enough but um the sort of you know the kiss I just felt it 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 rang false to me I don't know how you felt about that well I thought it was not uh, motivated and you know the problem is when you don't know how the movie's going to end then you then you don't know how to lay the groundwork for the ending right Uh, exactly you know if if they knew that that was how the movie was going to was going to end you know, then they could have done things earlier on to create uh, more of a romantic yes. possibility there. Yeah. Uh, but they really don't. I mean, there, there's a kind of a symmetry of they're both, you know, isolated and alone and, and whatever. Um, and you're right. I mean, I, I do think that the dad returning to the life of a cynical cop would have not worked. I mean, no then no one would have gone to see the movie. Right. Um, but it would have been better. Yeah, it would have been better if they established some bond, but without, with, without that, um, give, given that they already had the movie in the can, so they had to figure out some, something to do. Uh, but, you know, that's, Robert, that's tr- more true of movies than maybe some people realize is that yes. th- they make movies and they're not sure how they're going to end. And then you suddenly have this problem about, well, we've got three days to shoot it. and We mm. better have an ending here. Yeah. And they, um, they force something through. But, uh, but apart from that, um, it, 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 it's a, it is, it, you're right. I mean, it's a weird movie in some ways and it does feel like two movies. And cause the first half, what, what really struck me, which was interesting is when they're introducing all of the various police officers, they all have families. And then Jim Wilson, who your father plays, he is in this small room. And I like the detail of he's doing his dishes in the same sink sink that he obviously washes and brushes his teeth in. And um, which I th- I really, really like that. And um, he's he's a, a police officer that, you know, clearly abuses his power and is quite rough with a lot of these various criminals. But he's sort of highlighting it in an empathetic way because uh, he's someone who just takes his work home with him and he's alone and he was a failed, uh, well, you don't necessarily know if he was a failed football player, but he was like a star uh, football player in college and he's become a cop and he's, he's bitter. Um, 
and he just he just takes things takes things the wrong way and I like how everyone else around him is sort of like hey you know you've got to you've got to take it easy and he just can't I mean I think he was sort of very self-destructive and perhaps didn't like himself at all and this this whole second movie where he's in a totally different environment um you you it, you know I think it's sort of up to the audience whether I mean is is he being softer on I, Ida Lupino, you know, because he's suddenly he's so patient, he's so compassionate, and uh, he's generous. Whereas in the first half of the movie, he was the complete opposite. So, you know, is he doing that because something about Ida Lupino is bringing that out of him, or is he doing it because he knows he he has he can't uh, hit people around uh, because you know his job is is really on the line. Uh, perhaps a combination of the two. I don't I don't know. What you thought about that? Well, I, that no, that uh, that strikes me as right. I mean, um, the first part of the movie, yeah, he's he's alone in this looks like a one room apartment. Um, he's a bachelor, but at the same time, he's kind of this anal guy who you know does the dishes right away, yeah, and um, cleans his hands obsessively. Uh, Ah uh, yes, that was uh, another great detail. Yeah, and, after uh, after hitting these guys, and then he was they really made note to show that scrubbing, and right. and I think that Rubbing was another indication of his yes of his he sort of hated what he was doing, and you see even when he was hitting that one guy around as he's trying to get information. I know Jim in your book in the book on your father highlighted that how he kept saying, "Why do you guys make me do this? I know you're going to talk." Um, you know, so he feels he has to do these things. And he can't find any other way to do it. He's not equipped to um, try to find other methods, you know. But I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. No, I think that's right. He's kind of, um, he, he's a fanatic. Mm -hmm. um, he's kind of like reminded me of um, Al Pacino in, in, in Heat. I don't know if you know that movie. Oh, yes. But yes, with the great, great, yeah. great movie where, 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 early on in the movie John Voight is saying this this guy's a fanatic he's been through four marriages you know and all he does is think about getting you know getting the bad guys uh yeah so dad is there in his apartment and at first you think he's playing solitaire but what he's doing is studying photos of all the criminals he needs to find yes yes um and then uh yeah, they, they go out in the car sequences, which again, it's it always struck me that those are very claustrophobic. I mean, they mm. got a car that was about two thirds the size of what it should be with those three big guys in it. They're mm -hmm. all cramped together in it. Um, and the, the first part of it is, it seems to me, fairly um, uh, standard film noir. I mean, I don't know if they were standard by then, but you know, standard film noir setups. Um, uh the the scene i did i did i mentioned last time that when i watch movies uh, i'm always interested in who the minor actors are uh right. because when you grow up in hollywood uh, the people people you know are minor actors i mean there's not that many movie stars and you, you're always intrigued by who are the minor actors so uh they go into uh they go into the bar uh, the bar scene, which is the first time I think you see Dad really interacting with anyone. Yes. Uh, and and the first, so the first guy is this kind of weirdo character. He's sort of the Elijah Cook character, you know, the kind of weirdo. Mm -hmm. Don't know really what he's saying. Uh, and, and and then uh, he, Dad has this encounter with this young woman uh, who's doing a Veronica Lake impression, from what I could see. <laughs> Uh, and she, yes listen she's not even credited in the movie so oh wow yeah so i, I did, did not some, know that i did some investigation of her her name is nita talbot she was the one who was underage in the bar and then he said hey why do you have an underage girl in here right i think she's actually i think thought she was very interesting in yeah in fact um i thought she was more interesting than, than the other woman who also had an interesting story Yes. Uh, Cleo Moore is the name of the woman that 
the dad has yeah to that in. he goes to after yeah cleo she played myrna boyers yes um uh, nina talbot had a 50-year career is that right <laughs> despite being uncredited and on dangerous ground, uh, she had the longest career of probably anyone in that movie next to <laughs> Ida Lupino. Yeah. Uh, she, she immediately went into television, uh, but she did high quality television. And those, in the 1950s, particularly, there was high quality television. Oh, yes. Like Play, yeah. Playhouse 90, Alcoa Presents. Uh, Incredible so she, stuff in the live television days, yeah. Um, and then she, yeah, she had a 50 year career. She, her career only ended in the late 1990s and, but wow. all doing, you know, the love boat and things like this. So good yeah. for her, you know? Um, well, I know we touched on that last time and yeah, you're right. And as an actor myself, I know, I mean, often, you know, people are doing bit parts for 50 years and the public may not know them, but they're, but they're working, they're making a living. They're doing okay. <laughs> And that's quite frankly who you tend to, if, if you if you go to see these things filmed, which when, when I was younger, I, I would, uh, those are actually the actors you tend to get to know because they're the ones, first of all, you know, they were on the last movie and now you're seeing them again. Right. Uh, they're not big stars, you know, so they're not standoffish. Exactly. Uh, now the, the the interesting actors Cleo Moore is the woman who plays uh, the girlfriend of the guy he beats up. I guess yeah. that's her connection. Yeah, uh, she he he was looking for in because the the original Mur the someone off the top. You know, we we hear that they're looking for this guy who killed a police officer. So uh, Jim, who your father plays, is following leads, and it takes him to this woman Cleo Moore, and he's trying to find her boyfriend who he thinks knows something. That, that was an interesting uh, scene because she was so flirtatious with your father and then uh, with Jim Wilson. And, and, and he, he seems receptive to it because she says, well, uh, what are you going to you, you, Are you going to be a big, strong man and be rough with me? And then it cuts to him leaving. And then he got the information from her from her. So I, 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 I felt that they were implying he, he had sex with her or something, or maybe she, he hit her and she enjoyed it. Uh, you know, like, uh, and, and he enjoyed it in return. I don't know if, if you thought that was a suggestion there. I thought that was very much a suggestion yeah. because immediately afterwards, uh, the, 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 it is immediately followed by dad walking down the stairs by yes. himself. Yes. Uh, and in fact, when I watched the movie, uh, I, I, I asked my wife to look at that scene and say, what, what do you think is happening here? Yeah. I watched it twice. That scene. That's why I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> Very it's, interesting how they got that through this. Cause if you look at the dialogue, the, 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 the production code, they wouldn't have seen anything that, you know, that was blatant. Right. So all she says is you're a big, a strong man who's going to be rough, but it's the way she says it and the way that they're reacting which was really clever. And, and even as he leaves, he looks a little, he looks a little sluggish, you know? So uh, I thought that was great, but I, I, I certainly, it was another dimension to the way, you know, he, he sort of, you know, he has no girlfriend, no family. So perhaps this is, this is uh, the, the kind of women he sleeps around with. And then the, uh, and then a lot, and he has no friends really, you know, he see, he makes excuses not to go to his, partners uh, dinners and family get-togethers and and uh and if he needs information from others you know he roughs them up he he does he hits them and but i i thought that was a quite an interesting detail it's a very interesting scene and i think it needs to be watched then in tandem with the idol lapino exchange because notice that he's in exactly the same situation with idol lapino of needing to get the information exact exactly. same situation where am I getting the information? And I and I remember, uh, I, I remember thinking when I saw the then the later Ida Lupino encounters that this is exactly parallel to that, and clearly the filmmakers are they're making a point about how different Dad is, yes. but he, it remains that he's not entirely different, and that's one of the problems again that we talked about with the ending. Yes, is that it is that if he had, 
if they wanted to establish the basis for some romantic connection, uh, that was the time to establish it. And the contrast between uh, Cleo Moore, who's this classic 1950s busty blonde, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then the sultry, sophisticated Ida Lupino, uh, you know, that was good. And 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 yes, that I contrast agree. that contrast worked. Um, but I, I, I it, another thing I, sorry, take attention away from the movie, but um, when I watched that sequence, um, I, I always felt that one of the problems in my dad's career, I don't know if it was a problem, but, you know, my dad was never a romantic lead. Um, and I always wondered, you know, uh, why not? Um, now, sometimes I would say it's simply because an actor never gets a chance to show they can do that. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, if an actor has a success, as my father did with Crossfire, which is his first real success, right? The, they, they tend to cast him in the same role. They tend to think, well, you've got to do this. That's what you do. Um, but I always kind of wondered about that, that my father never did romantic leads very well. I mean, he, he played them in movies, but they weren't the more successful ones. Um, and he also uh, never did comedy, even though my father was an extraordinarily funny guy, but that mm -hmm. never came across on screen. So that kind of provoked in me that particular, that kind of sexually charged encounter about, you know, uh, why was that dimension never one that was, uh, you know, as I recall in my father's movies generally, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, question because he certainly, as I said, I mean, was just, was such a good actor. And as I said last time, he could do so much by doing so little. And obviously he was so convincing in these rougher type of men or, you know, whether they were bigots or, or, rough cops but he certainly like even in odds against tomorrow when he had to be charming uh with gloria graham or even with uh, the the woman the the first woman who when he's looking for information and he's he's flirtatious with her but it it i suppose it, i suppose when he would do that it was always in um it was always when people do it in a very inappropriate time <laughs> but he was always so convincing and it makes him look sleazy uh, in those roles, but he certainly had the qualities. So uh, all you have to do is, you know, take those qualities and put it in a, in a different context. And I think, it, I think he, I'm surprised. Yeah. It's a good point. Even uh, early in the film, he's at, he goes to the bar and you see that woman behind the bar is smiling at him and they don't cut to his close up as he's looking at her, but um, he's quite sweet. And then as soon as she says, Oh God, you know, if my boyfriend, you know, thought I even look at a cop. Uh, she says something like that along the lines, like, you know, he, he throw me out or something. And then he, you know, he just turns and, turns away, yeah. and he turns away as if to say, Oh God, you know, and I, I think that was another highlight of the way people off uh, in, in the film anyways, often were looking at cops as um, the enemy and who, do they, who do they think they are? And, and stuff like and stuff like that and and good reason to particularly his character who was so um who abused you know abused his power i don't, I don't know what you if uh, how, did you did you feel the this was more of an empathetic look at cops or somewhat critical i mean what did you think of that aspect of it well i think it was um it was interest it was very interesting because Part of that was sort of a, you know, Clint Eastwood, you know, why yes. do they, why do these people prevent us from beating everybody up? Uh, but at the same time, uh, Ed Bagley, who reappears in this movie as he was That's in right. Us Tomorrow. I forgot he was in this. Yes. I forgot he was part in, in this, too. but. Um, and interestingly, uh, uh, that interesting scene with Ed Bagley, because, um, one of the things about movies is that uh, you you convey an enormous amount in scenes that involve eating, because uh, everybody knows about eating. Everyone knows what the customs are around eating. So you can establish a lot about characters by putting them in a scene where they're eating. Uh, 
and uh, here's Ed Begley, you know, wolfing down the peas <laughs> and whatever. And he asked Robert Ryan if he wants anything. And, and of course, dad who's living this, you know, solitary, sterile existence, you know, mm -hmm. says, no, I'm fine. You know, while Ed Begley is, 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 but Ed Begley is, I thought was very sympathetic. I mean, he comes across not as some, in a Clint Eastwood movie, you know, the guy who says, Clint, you can't beat everyone up is always some sort of unpleasant guy, you know, or prissy guy or something like that. Uh, Ed Begley sounds very reasonable when he says you can't yeah. beat everybody up. Yeah, he was. <laughs> uh, so it is sort of uh, sympathetic to cops, but also sympathetic to the idea that what dad is doing is is, is beyond, the, beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, uh, it's uh, in that sense, I think the second half of the movie is clearly motivated by you know, dad needs to find another way to do this or something else to do. Yes. And the, and the bond then, the bond between the dad and the, the young boy, uh, Ida Lupino's son, is also then very interesting because all of the previous interactions between Robert Ryan and, and the, um, the criminals have been, you know, let's shoot them first and ask questions later. Uh, whereas from the word go, he's sympathetic to what Ida Lupino says about her son, that he's, he needs mental help. I mean, there's a typical thing that would have been scoffed at back in the city, you know, right. These aren't, these aren't criminals. They need mental help. Right. Uh, but immediately dad is saying, you know, I promise you, you know, your son will not be shot. Um, and, and so all that works, works very, very well. I thought, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree. And I, and what was interesting about about that aspect of the film was really showed that, you know, which is typical of noir of how all these characters, there's no clear protagonist and antagonist. Everything falls within the shades of gray because Jim, who your father plays, is obviously full of flaws. And even Ida Lupino, to, to even though she's the the one of the nicest characters and the most gen I mean here's a woman who was losing her sight and a doctor said that there was a, a chance to treat it if she went away into a hospital somewhere and she said no because uh she didn't want it was actually her uh, her brother not her son the the young kid um she she was she didn't want her him to be alone because he needs me so she's willing to go blind for this poor, for this, uh, for this young, for her younger brother. But then at the same time, here she is complicit in hiding him, uh, even though, but you can understand why, because she knows, you know, uh, he'll get killed or they'll hurt him. And, uh, and, and another character was the uh, father of the young girl who was killed. Um, you can totally understand his rage, but he was so unlikable. <laughs> he was so uh, rude and mean. And and he literally was about to slap Ida Lupino in the face for information. He would slap a blind woman, which even you know Ryan, your father was who was such a rough guy would not right. would not have done. You know, so everyone sort of exists in the in the shades of gray, um, which which I, I I really appreciated about the film. But you you brought up a good point in terms of you know which was very common, especially then you know, anytime a character had any kind of mental health issue is like the last place they, they want, the last thing they were, anyone wanted to do was to help them. It was like to just, you know, keep them in kind of solitary confinement uh, as opposed to looking for any ways to help, because that was an even worse option to go to an institution of some kind. I don't know if that was something that stood out to you. Well, it struck me because you didn't hear that much in those days of someone actually needs right. help. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I can't think of any movie off the top of my head where of that era where that would be treated sympathetically. And I, I thought the young kid was was quite good. He was very believable. He was, uh, yeah. Um, and you're absolutely right about Ward Bond um the 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 father character would have been i think a little deeper mm -hmm. if if some of his uh pain at losing his daughter was there and not just this kind of 
because Ward Bond has become the Robert Ryan character in the first part of the movie. Exactly. Exactly. If, if, if I have to beat it out of Ida Lupino, that's if I have to, you know, beat it out of her, I'll do that. If I have to sweet mm. talk her, you know. He was sort of the mirror image of Jim. He, it was sort of like he's reborn in the second half of the film, and now he's sort of stuck with stuck with him the, his past. Like this guy represents uh, the the side of himself that he hates. But you know, you you brought up a good point because I had to go back just to watch when we first saw Ward Bond because at first I thought he did. Uh, you're right. You didn't feel any kind of pain about losing. I thought he was someone from the town just wanted to find this guy at first because he was just he was just a vicious. Well, I mean, perhaps not vicious, but well, somewhat vicious for sure. Um, guy who was trying to, you know, do whatever he had to do to find out where this kid is. The one part I, I didn't quite, I don't, I don't know how I quite felt about when, when he's, when the kid falls and dies as they're chasing him. And he's suddenly sympathetic to the fact just because he was a kid. Uh, Cause he was like, you know, in his teens um, that I, I wasn't sure why that would suddenly make him go so soft. I don't know how you felt about that. No, I, I think that I'll mention something about Ward Bond in a moment, but uh, you're right. In fact, I had forgotten that he was the father. <laughs> <laughs> My remembrance, I always, the way I thought it was, was that he was the local sheriff or whatever. Because yes. remember, remember, dad is given this assignment of go up and help the local authorities, uh, uh, you know, in, in upstate New York. Or I felt like New York, even I though. Think I think so. Know. I think it's upstate New York. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, no symmetry with odds against tomorrow. Um, uh, but but I thought my remembrance had been that Ward Bond was the sheriff, and then he was the guy that needed help. Yeah. And dad goes up and helps him. And I'd totally forgotten because, as you say, there's no, there, there, there's nothing in the performance that mm -hmm. really suggests that this is a father. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then given that he is a father, why does he then suddenly become more sympathetic when the young boy dies? Since that, after that was, all, yeah, his intention that was, was to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> that well, that, yeah, because I thought, well, why do you care that he's young? I mean, well, I don't know why that would make any much uh, of a difference for him. But I, per, I, again, I think it was another way to, uh, uh, I, it, they were probably sitting around thinking, well, maybe, maybe the father has to be somewhat sympathetic. So, let's just like, you know, push him in this area. But uh, I, that, that didn't quite, uh, that didn't quite register with me. I just want to highlight the name, the, uh, yeah, the young boy, Sumner Williams. I haven't seen him, but he played the young boy who um, commits this murder, uh, which in you're right, he was, uh, it really, really was a, a fantastic performance. Um, was there any other uh, thoughts you had on this film that you wanted to share? Well, my father hated Ward Bond. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, my father <laughs> didn't hate many people, uh, but he hated uh, the two people he most hated were Ward Bond and Richard Nixon. And for the same reason. Oh my God. Oh, I see, um, okay. Ward Bond was uh, a famous uh, hatchet man for the blacklist. Uh, uh. To the extent to which uh, almost everyone hated Ward Bond, actually. Um, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, no, he, um, uh, and that, look, not surprisingly, that was about the only thing I knew about Ward Bond growing up was, was that he had been, um, he had been someone who had worked closely with the Un-American Activities Committee to um, finger, you know, former communists and leftists. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently he did it in a way that just uh, alienated everybody uh, so that for the latter part of his career, uh, I mean, the reason why he only worked in John Wayne movies was because John Wayne would, would want to have him hired, but other people found him. And he was responsible for one of the more interesting artifacts of that era, which is um, the not the the. Ayn Rand, you know, the uh, Atlas Shrugged and uh, the, the libertarian right wing person uh, was a worked in Hollywood for a while. Uh, and she was very involved in trying to get leftists uh, out of the film industry and Ward Bond and Ayn Rand 
Ward Bond had Ayn Rand uh, write up a pamphlet about what American movies should look like, uh, which you can actually find online. And it's it's rather bizarre document. Wow. Um, and it led to, um, she launched a vicious attack on uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, as God. Being, yeah, listen to this. As, <laughs> <coughs> as being un-American. Um, <laughs> You and I had never thought about that in that way before, but I, I, I've heard very, I've heard kind of various stories about that thinking back then about that film during Hewak, yeah. Well, Which is insane, but it... <laughs> she thought she had two arguments. Uh, one of them was that it portrayed the banker in a negative light. <laughs> 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 this was un-American to show Mr. Potter as as a mean guy. Oh my God! Uh, how you would have a movie without that, I don't know. But right, so presumably she wanted to ban Christmas Carol too, because Mr. Potter is just Ebenezer Scrooge. Right. <laughs> but the, the reason why that and her connection was particularly uh, of salient in our family was that the the main authors of It's a Wonderful Life were a, a screenwriting team named Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett. Uh, and they were very, very close friends with my parents. When my parents moved to New York, they were their, among their very closest friends. They, they were serious A-list screenwriters for a very long time. Uh, and uh, uh, specifically, Ayn Rand went after Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett because of their uh, leftist associations of being friends with all these left-wing people, as of course everyone was in that era. Um, so, so Ward Bonds, uh, anyway, whenever I watch the movie, I'm mainly thinking, what is Ward Bond doing in this movie? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm surprised, quite frankly, that, that he must have been, um, he must have worked for RKO. I mean, that's how people like, that's how a character like that. He's an RKO player and he's available at the time. So. Right, right. Well, cause, cause this, this would have been, I imagine when Hughes, Howard Hughes was running things and I'm, I'm sure he had no problem using someone like Ward Bond. And I, I know your father found the way to get along with him based on the, you know, the, the book J.R. Jones uh, wrote, but he was so right wing himself. He probably, I would just imagine that using Ward Bond wasn't a problem, but uh, uh, it, it obviously worked in to your father and his advantage because they both don't get along the whole movie and they even have that big fight. <laughs> in the snow at a certain point but i i think the main message of the piece is interesting just in terms of you know if you're in you know it's certainly talking about the nature of loneliness but also the you know if you're if you are sort of unhappy or miserable and or doing things that are making you unhappy find uh, something that you can put out that's good which is the advice his partner gives him uh and obviously that's what he was finding with Ida Lupino. So uh, I, I think, you know, I think if he had just went back and they had just ended it with him walking in, that would have been, you know, may, maybe he would have just been a, a help to her or, or uh, some kind of connection with her just as, as a friendship. I mean, not that I couldn't believe it would turn romantic, but I just thought it was a little too watered down and simplified. It's particularly it was right after this woman's brother had been had been killed uh, well, I didn't keep you know fell and died so but apart from no, that I, I, you know it's quite you know it's pretty interesting no I think that's right I mean um uh and they do set up the possibility that he could have said to her you know well let me stand by you when you have this operation uh but, but of course that would have meant uh you know suggesting ending the movie on a note of friendship between right. the, the two leads. And I, I'm not sure Hollywood. Yeah, a man and a woman at that time. I, I'm, I'm not sure it, it would have been like the ending of Saturday Night Fever, you know, where Travolta and what's Oh, that's name? right. Get to be just, uh, that That was not in the cards in 1950 or whenever the movie was. Yeah, made, uh, that's a know. good, that's a good point. The, I just, uh, I just had one last question. I was curious, it, it must be, it must be interesting in a way to read, you know, to have read the biography on your dad 
And I was curious if you had discovered anything in that J.R. Jones found that you surprised you or that you really didn't know about him? Oh, yeah. No, I did an enormous amount uh, because, uh, you know, your, your sense of your father's career, uh, it, it, you know, if your father's a movie actor, your, your sense of their career is just a string of movies. Uh, and you're aware of the movies they've made, and you're, and but not even then, all, not even all of them. I mean, you're mainly aware of the movies that, particularly the older movies that that get mentioned periodically. Um, but you don't really have much knowledge of, you know, the context of the films or what was going on. Um, and, and so, uh, reading Jim's book was 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 great. Uh, because uh, it put it all in, in the context of a career. Uh, the, 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 the stuff in, in the book, which is very prominent about uh, my mother starting a school and my father's involvement in supporting that, uh, I, I, I did know that story pretty well. Right. <clears throat> because uh, quite frankly, that was more a topic around the house than my father's movie career. Uh, so, uh, um, and I thought Jim did a, just a fabulous job of, of explaining, uh, you know, why a career like that works out the way it does. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, actors make movies because they have to make money. And exactly. so why did, you, why did you make this movie? Well, I had to, yeah. I had to pay the bills. Um, and then you have uh, to deal with, and when the studio system was there, you had to deal with lunatics like Howard Hughes. Right. Uh, when the studio system dissolved, you had to deal with independent producers, which was a whole other issue. Uh, and um, all of that was was really a revelation to me. I didn't know much about that at all. The book is called The Lives of Robert Ryan by J.R. Jones, which uh, I highly, highly recommend if you're a fan of Robert Ryan or a classic Hollywood fan in general to to really to, to check out. It's a wonderful read. Chaney, thanks again for, for coming on. I appreciate that you take, uh, take the time to tell me about your father and talk about some of his work. So I hope that you can join me again sometime. No, it's, a lot, it's, it's great, Robert. I mean, as I said, I, I, first of all, it gives me the opportunity to learn more about some, some of these movies, which I don't, which, which I don't uh, always have. And uh, it's interesting also, uh, you are an exceptionally good uh, interviewer, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I periodically, you know, I'm interviewed about this. And um, uh, so I, I, I appreciate your your good perspective on the movies and your, your you know, insights about what's the strengths and the weaknesses. All of that is great. It's great to talk to you about them. I'm happy to do it again. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. It is bonus content that I release every single month exclusively, exclusively for people who sign up for my Patreon. And it is based on polls that I also send out at the beginning of every single month in which you will be able to vote on, which will make you very much part of the decision-making as to what I do on Patreon every single month. So if you like my work here on YouTube, head over there and check out the full details on how to become a member. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode I've ever done can be found youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head right here to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.